Okay, uh, my name is Jane Huckabee. I'm uh, the director of the International Human Rights Clinic um, here at the Law School, and it really is my great pleasure and privilege uh, to be able to introduce uh, Judith Kelly, uh, who is Senior Associate Dean and Professor of Public Policy and Political Science um, across the road here at Duke's uh, Sanford um, School of Public Policy. And uh, Professor Kelly will be giving a lecture um, that will address her recently published book um, entitled Scorecard Diplomacy, Grading States to Influence Their Reputation and Behaviour. Um, it's particularly a, a, a privilege and a pleasure um, to introduce you for not many, many, many reasons, but it is actually our very first um, event of the semester um, in our Human Rights um, in Practice series, um, a series that's convened um, and sponsored by the International Human Rights Clinic um, and the Centre for International um, and Comparative Law. Well, we have one of our co-directors um, of the centre here, Professor Larry Helfer. Um, for this particular event, we have um, a number of additional co-sponsors who I will mention very briefly, um, because we are very grateful, as always, um, for their support um, in sort of both advertising and the event and so forth. We have Duke's Advent School of Public Policy, uh, the Duke Human Rights Centre at the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Duke Human Rights Centre at the Keene Institute for Ethics, the Human Rights Law Society and the International Law Society as well. Um, I also want to mention briefly that um, the book will be available for purchase and signing um, right after the event today um, in the hallway outside the room. Um, and with that, uh, you know. thank you so much, Jane. and thanks to the law school for having me here. I'm going to try to uh, leave some room for questions at the end, but I did work on this project for like six years, and so sometimes it's hard to uh, contain myself. Anyhow, the question that I am going to be asking here is, uh, what can the inter international community do when uh, states are recalcitrant in undertaking various forms of reforms like human rights or political reforms that the international community broadly sees as beneficial. And that's sort of what ties my research together. And I'm going to uh, talk about this phenomenon that has risen, uh, particularly since the end of the 2000s, about using these ratings and rankings. And I'm going to apply this to the case of the US uh, foreign policy on human trafficking. So uh, what you see here is the front cover of the, uh, the human trafficking report that's issued uh, by the United States report, uh, the United States uh, Office of Trafficking in Persons in the State Department. So I should also mention that there's a website called scorecarddiplomacy.org, and if you go there, you'll be able to find all the auxiliary materials for the book, case studies, data, um, uh, sample chapters, uh, more information about human trafficking, um, news, other things that have, are related to the book. So if you're curious about that, that's how you'll find that. I want to start by rewinding a little bit. So if you go back to uh, 2001, uh, in, uh, in uh, Israel, in Israel, uh, officials are in a state of shock over uh, a statement that's been made by the U.S. Department of State, and they they uh, call an emergency conference, and people who were later interviewed about this described the reaction in Israel as hysterics. Um, fast forward a little bit to Jamaica. Uh, a similar event prompts the uh, mayor up to tell the press that the particular issue has, quote, jerked the country's at the highest levels. And then a few more years forward to Oman, and uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs there is warning the US ambassador uh, that Oman, Oman is going to be forced to reassess its relationship with the United States on a number of dimensions. They're even forced, uh, threatening to cancel some meetings having to do with some nuclear cooperation and other things. And, uh, and they're calling this incident a a knife in the back of a friend, and uh, and it's a personal insult to the Sultan. That's how it's being received. So what is going on? Why are these countries so ticked off? Well, the reason they're ticked off is this event that happens every single year, and that is the issuance of the human trafficking report that the State Department puts out every year. 
The gentleman that you see in the back here is Chris Smith from New Jersey, uh, who has been one of the primary sponsors of this legislation. <coughs> and uh, of course, Hillary uh, Clinton, their Secretary of State at the time, uh, putting out this report. Usually there's a press conference every year, and this press conference is an amplified in country with lots of uh, media attention uh, that the local embassies try to draw to this report. So, oh, wrong way. <clears throat> so what's in this report? In some ways it's very similar to the um, uh, State Department report on human rights practices that have been coming out since the 70s, and many of you may be familiar with that. Okay? Uh, so it'll have you know, some standard statements such as, the government of Gambia does not fully comply with the minimum standards for the elimination of human trafficking, uh, and, but it's making some kind of effort, so it's not making effort to do so, and then there'll be a, a long narrative as well that will cover three points in particular that come out of the, the Palermo Protocol, uh, uh, and also is based on the Trafficking and uh, 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 Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which was the act that authorized the the issuance of the report in the State Department, and that Representative Chris helped uh, author. And those three areas are prevention, protection, and prosecution. So, in some ways, that's very similar to the Human Rights Report. But here's why this report is so different and so interesting <coughs> to me is that in addition, we also have a grade. Every country gets a grade. Um, they can have one of four grades. Uh, they can have either a tier one, which means they're doing really well, they're complying, uh, and, uh, you know, and continue to make improvements in their efforts. And that's important to stress that this is not a report on the state of human trafficking in the country, not the magnitude, the scope, the severity of the problem. This is a report on how much is government trying to combat the problem, okay? Uh, so they can get a one, that means they're doing really well. They can get a tier two. A tier two means that they're not complying, but they're trying. And then they can get a tier three, which means they're not complying and they're not trying. And then there's a watch list. And the watch list is in between tier two and tier three. And what that says is, we think you're not complying, we think you're not trying, and if you don't start trying, you're gonna be a tier three, okay? So this is what I call scorecard diplomacy, in the sense that here we have the United States, or it could be some other actor, you know, watching sort of grading states on their performance. And it's part of a much broader phenomenon. It's not just in the area of human trafficking, and it's not just the State Department that's doing this. Here I have a database that I've put together. Um, there are some, I think, 170 or so of these uh, <coughs> types of uh, ratings, rankings, indicators. And you can see how they really start taking off around year 2000. And they've become <coughs> very prominent. You're probably familiar with some of them, like the Ease of Doing Business Index or Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index. You know, they are environmental ones now. And it's very interesting because They've become also a battle over norms and standards. Uh, for example, you could have a development index, but then you can have the sustainable development index or a gender development index. And so these uh, creators of these ratings and rankings are also trying to assert themselves in the space of defining what really the norms and the ideals should be like, or in some cases, even what the proper regulations are, as in the case of the ease of doing business index, which is interesting because the World Bank really doesn't have a mandate to monitor uh, business regulations in this way, but they issued this report, which is not binding in any way, and they've had a tremendous amount of say in the types of regulations that come past. So the questions I'm interested in in this book is, do countries respond to being monitored and rated in this way? If so, when do they respond? Why do they respond? And how do they respond? And what are some of the pros and cons of this type of approach? And I think it's a particular relevant question to ask in light of the fact that we've seen this kind of upswing 
you know, we've seen a diversification in the ways that we try to govern the world so globally, and we see that even within the, the law system, you know, we have treaties, we have this, that, and the other, we have non-binding things, and then we have these hybrid forms of uh, fora where states get together and, and talk, and, you know, there's a, a whole continuum of tools that are part of setting norms and standards. And I would argue this is part of that continuum. Um, and, uh, and, and it's happening at a time when we also have an increasing diffusion of uh, uh, evidence-based uh, policy, metrics being touted as important in deliverables that agents are supposed to uh, have in response to donors, et cetera, et cetera. So the argument that I'm going to make today uh, is not that we should have, we can create one of these indices and we can bring North Korea to its knees. That's, I, I realize that's not the kind of power we're talking about here. But I'm going to argue that these kinds of ratings and rankings can be really good bang for the buck. When you think about what goes into them and then you get in return, this is a, uh, a, a good a good value can be a good value in, in terms of what's being the effort that's being put in. Um, I will argue that this kind of scorecard diplomacy it's just a, just it's not just like you issue a report and there are the uh, the, the grades and you're done. And what's important is that it's embedded in a larger effort of diplomacy. Uh, furthermore, I think it's it's catalytic. Uh, so it's embedded in a larger effort of diplomacy and it catalyzes interest in the country to have a dialogue about how the country can improve, etc. Uh, and it's different from shaming in a number of different ways. Right? When we think about shaming, we might think about the EU issuing some kind of dimash, saying uh, you know, that uh, country X is behaving in a, 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 an abhorrent way, or you know, Amnesty International might say something like this. But these are ad hoc, okay? And they are ad hoc, and they are also only targeted at negative behaviors. And that's very different from this, because this is systematic. And I'm going to argue that that matters a lot, and also that it matters that you observe all sorts of behavior, not just the negative behaviors. Uh, and then I talk a little bit about what I think some of the conditional factors are that make it work. And uh, importantly, I also um, want to stress that that um, these kinds of ratings and rankings and my exploration of this topic in particular convinced me that this is really not just about money, that states in this particular realm at least do care about their <coughs> reputation. Uh, their legitimacy on, on, the, on the international stage in terms of how they're behaving in this, in this area. So uh, if we look at the report, I said I mentioned to you that there are four different types of grades that countries have gotten. And you can see um, uh, that the number of countries that have gotten tier one has not really changed so much over time. Uh, Tier three, it's not really changed so much over time. And you might say, well, then clearly things are not improving. But one thing that's important to understand is that because the State Department uses this as a tool, and they use it as a tool to push governments to do things, they, um, the goalposts are always moving. And the State Department is always trying to get countries to do more. And so uh, they may, uh, for example, have uh, a country, you may have a country that's not doing very much, and they'll have a certain grade, and then that grade will eventually drop based simply on the fact that the State Department got fed up with the fact that they're still not doing anything. So it's not an absolute measure even of what the, what the country is doing. It's, it's, it, it's a really strategic tool that's being applied individually to, to each country. Um, here, what you see on this map uh, is one way that we've seen the landscape change of how things have improved, at least if you believe that domestic laws matter at all. Domestic laws, in this case, that have been implemented and to criminalize human trafficking. And you might say, well, human trafficking is such a horrible thing. Surely it's always been illegal everywhere. But it's, such a, it's, it's a new and evolving type of crime and in many countries, in most countries, Actually, uh, in the past, it was prosecuted through a number of, of, of um, 
other legal measures that had to do with, say, kidnapping or other things. Okay? And so it was important to get the right kind of tool, and that's really been seen as a, uh, as a necessity. Um, furthermore, I also have found in my work that this is not really just cheap signals. A lot of times we say the international community pushes states to pass some kind of law, for example, domestically, and then it's just paper compliance, but they don't really actually change their behavior in the policies they're implementing. What this slide here shows you is um, another index that is measuring various practical things like do countries have shelters, do they have awareness campaigns, are they prosecuting people, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you've got that on the, on the, on the vertical axis here. And in the top uh, picture, we have set at zero the year that a country adopts a domestic law that criminalizes human trafficking. And you see in the years prior that there's not much movement up or down in their performance uh, in the more practical aspects, but that after they implement this law, we start to see a steady but slow climb in their measures that they're taking that are real and meaningful on the ground. And then if you compare with countries that just never really passed any kind of domestic law, you see that they don't, they don't see that same shift. Okay. And we've also started to see an uptake in prosecutions worldwide, uh, but that's a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say is this a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, the more we find, find data, this is a common problem in human rights, of course, the more we find data or shine a light, uh, the, the worse things might look. Um, now, what I have what I have uh, centered the book around is what I call the cycle of scorecard diplomacy. And that's what I want to spend some time walking through in this talk, in which I argue that the important thing here is the re-editive nature of this type of rating and ranking. Right? The fact that it's, it's, it's a process that is ongoing all the time. Okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through these stages, and I've already talked about the public monitoring and grading in terms of the report. But before I do so, I inserted a special law school disclaimer into my slideshow <laughs> because people are going to say, well, wait, well, wait, well, wait, all these countries ratified, a lot of them ratified the, the protocol, so isn't what about the protocol? I mean, maybe they're just all doing this in response to the protocol. There's nothing to do with this report. And, uh, and you are right that some countries are responding uh, and, and what their, their behaviors are correlated with whether they have ratified the protocol. And so in statistical analysis, that's very evident, actually, that countries that have ratified the Palermo Protocol are also more likely to criminalize domestically and take these measures. And they're also much more likely, actually, to be responsive to the US pressure. And, uh, but, but my point is that even when you consider that, you get additional bang for the buck with the scorecard diplomacy that the State Department has exerted. Okay, so. So my, my book is based on um, a ton of background work, interviews with people from around the world, a survey I put together of NGOs uh, from all over the world, um, uh, and also on uh, diplomatic records, because when, uh, when I first started doing this work, was coincided with the release of the WikiLeaks documents. And that was fascinating because suddenly I could see what was really going on, like, I, I could read the interactions between local officials when they were being told about what the grade they were going to get and what they said in response, et cetera, et cetera. And I should stress that, that my, my research is funded by the government. The US government paid me to look at these documents. Uh, nonetheless, I took precautionary measures and became a citizen uh, recently. <laughs> uh, yeah, just like a year ago, just so I would get the wrong. <laughs> okay. I also looked at thousands of, of media accounts uh, and primary documents from different organizations, of course, and then there's a statistical analysis and, and, and a bunch of case studies which are all available on that website I showed you in the beginning. So the step two in my cycle is the diplomacy, okay? And so one thing I did with all these um, WikiLeaks cables was trying to figure out what level is this really happening at? Who's really talking to whom? Because you think this is probably just like some lower level folks who sit and talk about this stuff. That turns out to be surprisingly untrue that this is, we're talking about uh, a lot of folks at the level of minister and sometimes even head of state. 
So what this graph here shows you is a breakdown of the type of official that's occurring in the, in the discussions, in the meetings that I have identified through the WikiLeaks cables. And you can see that, you know, how many of them are at the level of head of state. And then I've also uh, uh, identified the discussions like what level are they taking place at on the U.S. side. So it's really U.S., uh, almost half the cases are U.S. personnel that are senior U.S. officials, meaning it's the ambassador or the it's attorney general who happens to be in the country or something like that. So a lot of these are very, a very high level. And furthermore, I was able to estimate how many of these conversations take on, take, uh, go on during the year. And of course, that's varying hugely from one country to the other, uh, because you know, in a country uh, you know, where it's much less of an issue, we won't have that many conversations. But I found that on average, uh, between 8 and 16 conversations about human trafficking is occurring. It's, it's, a, it's a fair slice of US diplomacy, so much so that the US embassies around the world have openly complained uh, in reports uh, to the State Department about the amount of resources they're actually devoting to this effort. Here's just a, a quick slide to show you the case of Israel. These are the type of officials that are popping up in the conversations, all right? So foreign minister, Israeli ambassador, uh, you know, uh, Director uh, General for Economic uh, Affairs, the part of, uh, party leaders, etc. Okay, the Prime Minister's uh, Chief of Staff, and things like that. So uh, a pretty, pretty impressive group of people. Also, I, I did a survey of of uh, 500 NGOs around the world, and I asked them. Uh, what type of actors were involved in addressing and talking about human trafficking in their countries. And if they said that uh, an embassy was involved, then I asked them, oh, what embassies happen to be involved? So it wasn't leading them about the United States? And you can see you know, that the ratio of answers that said, this is the United States out there doing this, compared to even other big countries, or you know, key countries like the United Kingdom, uh, is, is like, it's like 14 to 1. So there's a ton of diplomacy going on. Lots of conversations. You can read in these cables about like, going into detail about these things. But what's so important is that this is always motivated by this grade that they're getting, right? And um, I also ask people out there in the field, you know, what kind of activities has the uh, U.S. Embassy been involved in if they said the U.S. Embassy had been involved, right? And these are you know, pretty uh, things like asking for the legislation, like we would expect, given um, my, my argument. Um, but they're also putting together workshops, uh, raising awareness, uh, they're providing funding sometimes, uh, training government officials, uh, and oftentimes sitting down and helping write action plans for governments and things like that. Uh, and contrary to the popular narrative, which is that the United States has been over, overly zealous and focused on prosecution, uh, most of the funding that the State Department gives out in forms of grants to different countries is actually not for prosecution, but for prevention and protection measures. And that's why it's gone in different places in the world. Okay, so um, an important part of scorecard diplomacy, <laughs> I argue, of these types of ratings and rankings is that it empowers some third party actors to become involved as well. It's not just US diplomats sitting and having conversations with domestic officials. Once this is out there in the open and because it's public, you get the media and you get civil society involved in particular. Uh, and um, Part of that happens just through funding. You can see a lot of the funding that comes from, from the United States goes to NGOs, and a lot of it also goes to IGOs. <coughs> so this whole program is helping to empower a bunch of actors, and you often will even see, like you'll read something by, I'll read something about the ILO, a program that they may have in a country to fight human trafficking, and then it will say at the bottom, oh, it's funded by the United States Department of State. Um, Here's a, 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 a picked Oman, and just to look at the news coverage around human trafficking, and you can see that it really peaks around the time when the, uh, when the report comes out. The report is effective at garnering attention to the issue in the country. And then I also asked the NGOs that I surveyed, you know, 
are you actually getting involved in this conversation based on this report? And uh, half of them said that they discussed the report with officials inside the national government. That's, that's I think, pretty impressive. Uh, and they also get involved with the United States. Uh, I have a whole separate article that's just about the breakdown of, of this survey and everything that I say is pretty robust to whether or not you take out countries that get funding from the US or don't have funding from the US. That's not really what's driving this. Okay, so we've got this public monitoring and grading. The report that goes out, you've got the heavy diplomacy uh, with the uh, embassies in the country, officials traveling through. You've got NGOs, IGOs, and the media really magnifying this pressure in the country. That leads to concern about the reputation. And I think what's important is not just that they're concerned about the fact that they've just been potentially criticized or gotten a grade, but they're worried about their future grade. Right? And that's, that's really important. Um, so uh, here's a quote from, um, uh, again, Israel, the case of Israel. After the report comes out and Israel had gotten a bad grade, we see this kind of concern with reputation. Uh, a statement, you know, that uh, from from uh, from the deputy foreign minister saying that a, a report that lumps Israel together with countries like and then there's some set of bad actors feels that feels really uncomfortable, right? And it has a direct impact on Israel's standing. Like this notion that our, you know, who we are has been uh, has been impacted by this. So it's real important aspect of these kinds of gradings and rankings as opposed to the ad hoc shaming as well is that this is comparative. So countries look around and can see, oh, I'm getting bunched up with this other country. It's not just I'm being criticized, but oh, I'm on level with this or that, you know? And, and you also see these kinds of maps from ratings and rankings and indicators that makes it very easy. That's another thing. This kind of Reading and ranking, it's much more digestible quickly and can be disseminated than sort of a long narrative report. And countries can quickly go, oh, you know, yeah, Denmark is doing okay, that's fine, we're with the green people, you know? <laughs> uh, I thought it was also interesting, given that we think about how countries, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we think about how, how law and our different instruments we use in the international community might affect how countries see themselves. I thought it would be interesting to see how, who do they relate to, who do they compare themselves to. And, and based on the analysis of the documents, I treated a table in my book where you can see uh, who is comparing themselves with whom. You see typical regional groupings, but you also see some groupings that are identity based on language or on economic clubs you might be in, etc. Uh, and I think that's fascinating and it's evidence that underscores this notion that I'm reacting to this because I see myself as part of a community, a group that I care about having standing within. So now they're worried, you know, and uh, one of the reasons I argue that they worry too, and that this is a good thing, is that they care about their status. Even if they've gotten a good grade, this is an effective tool, as opposed to shaming, which is just you've been bad, in this case, it's like at one of those students you have in your classes, or one of those students that you are in the class, where you've gotten an A on something, and you just want to keep that up, right? You care about keeping on getting an A. Some countries care about keeping on getting that tier one. They don't want to fall, and so it's a motivating factor even to sort of maintain your status. And you see this played out, for example, Ghana's Minister of Women and, and, and uh, uh, Children Affairs, and she was told that you know, Ghana might fall if they don't manage to pass this law. And then I said, well, we must keep clear one. This is important. We have to keep that good grade. Um, I also think that this type of diplomacy engages personal careers in a way, because there are people who have sort of portfolio responsibilities within a government, and if a grade is coming out all the time, externally imposed, then that's an assessment of that person's performance in his government domain. And we see that also turn around into credit taking, um, that when a country does well, in the case of, of, uh, of, of Pakistan here, you know, 
then uh, the Minister of the Interior takes credit, you know, uh, that, uh, and that, that the U.S. has upgraded Pakistan's ranking, which has improved the stature of Pakistan before the world. I should also say that there are potentially material concerns because the, uh, the TPPA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, does allow for same sanctions of certain types of aid if you fall to tier three. <clears throat> However, this has really not been implemented because there's this convenient clause that says that the president can waive this if it's politically not very uh, a savvy thing to do which it tends to be, and so therefore everybody who, the only countries that really are sanctions are the ones that are sanctioned anyway for other big reasons, and so it doesn't really happen, but we shouldn't dismiss the fact though that that could still be a, a factor because um, countries, uh, they, they know that it can get way, but there's still that, you know, that, um, that potential fear. So one of the things I thought was interesting about this project was trying to tease out how much of this is really about reputation and image, and how much is potentially about being worried about these concerns, and I'll get to that in a moment. Finally, I also argue that, that this type of report, and one of the reasons it generates concern, is that it also becomes a vehicle for learning and socialization, because the narratives that are in the report themselves convey policy responses that are being taken in other countries, and the discourse in meetings uh, are an opportunity to have conversations with countries about, you know, it's actually when you when you uh, <coughs> when you say send your child to be uh, work in the in in the city potentially with a family member and they're supposed to be going to school but they end up working as a domestic servant. You know, you may think that's culturally okay, but we actually think of that in category as a form of human trafficking. Or when you do X Y C that this is really how we think about it. And so there's opportunities to have discourse around what these, some of these practices are. Um, Argentina, for example, there was a long discussion about consent. Uh, you know, there was a, a lot of provincial governors who were profiting, or are still profiting from um, brothels and things like that. And, and, um, and so the, the law that was passed said, you know, it's fine as long as the, they agree, <laughs> you know. But it's, it's, that's really not how the international protocol is written. Um, finally, I keep saying finally, <laughs> there's a professionalization and learning also, right? That, uh, that because information is, is requested annually, uh, that, that sort of routinizes certain types of data gathering. And we've seen countries create task forces, create bureaus, create statistical cap capability. Uh, and that, in response to the report, and that, and that then focuses the mind, now it becomes something that's on the agenda. So those are some of the mechanisms, I think, that are in place for generating concern in response to the report, in addition to the pressure that comes uh, indirectly or through the diplomacy. So I wanted to look at the uh, content of the reactions, because I said I, I wanted to try to tease out how much of this is really about um, countries being concerned about their image versus money or other things. And so I, I sat down and I tried to code all of these different reactions in the, in the cables. And I put them into different categories. And I just want to share some of them, some of them with you. Uh, there are concerns about funding. Okay, So for example, in 2004, there was a Venezuelan official that asked like, exactly what programs might be affected uh, by, uh, by having this status. Um, in uh, 2009, there was a Bahrainian uh, official that was concerned about how Bahrain stepped up against its uh, 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 Gulf Pro the, 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 the Gulf uh, Corporation Council uh, neighbors. Uh, in Egypt saying, "Oh, after all, Egypt is not Thailand." <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, Venezuela, we're not as bad as Cuba on this issue. Uh, and and, um, uh, and there's cases of face-saving efforts, right? And in the case of Belize, like the prime minister goes on television and defends his country's record. He's saying, oh, this report came up, blah, 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 it's all baloney, you know. Why does he feel the need to do that, right? Um, and um, uh, they use words like, you know, the black mark of being on the list. So I found a lot of things in, sort of in the... In the uh, 
in the column of that things that were more related to image concerns. Um, and there are also a lot of reactions that are just more negative or ambivalent. I can't really infer why they're upset, but I can definitely infer that they're upset and they, they care about the report, right? Uh, uh, and uh, so there are a number of different ones. Actually, one of my favorite ones is uh, I put in the disappointment category, but I like this. I like this reaction because it's hard to fake, right? I mean, one thing that's nice about the cables is that I can eliminate the uh, the, uh, the fact that officials are trying to impress their publics because it's not a public reaction, but they're still reacting to the U.S. diplomat. But it's pretty hard to just fake your your face going pale, right? Uh, meaning it was definitely taken aback by by the news. Um, and then there's all this bragging that takes place as well, right? That is some welcome recognition, and as I showed you earlier with the Pakistan uh, minister as well. Uh, so when I, when I um, compare these kinds of reactions and the frequency of them, I found there's about a four to one, cate or a four to one ratio between uh, categories that I would say fall in that image column versus the, the funding column. So I thought that was interesting. Um, and also in more statistical analysis, I find that the, uh, that the foreign aid uh, category is not really gaining any traction as an explanatory variable, whereas whether if you ratified the Palermo Protocol, for example, you're, you're more concerned about your image in this area and you're going to respond more to the U.S. efforts. Um, so in terms of just trying to look at the efforts that are going on on the ground, I went back to that those NGOs that I said I had included in that survey, and I asked them uh, about what their attitudes were uh, towards the uh, activity of the U.S. TIP report and how important the U.S. Uh, or what role they thought the U.S. had played uh, in in their country, and, and most of them had volunteered that information prior, and I followed up with them based on that. And I was this is for me was the most astonishing result of the whole six years of doing this project was that like two thirds of NGOs out there working in the field said that the U.S. was a, a somewhat important or the most important actor. But what really astonished me is that when I then asked them like how many really had, because you can be important and it can be rotten what you're doing. Like how many of you really think this is a negative thing? I got two negative responses, which was, blew my mind given the overall climate of anti-Americanism, et cetera, that, that was prevailing uh, during much of the time I was you know, doing this research. Um, so we also did, I also did a statistical analysis of criminalization, that means domestic criminalization. And the thing is, when the United States first started this report, not all countries were included, because after the TVPA was passed, uh, the State Department wasn't able to rev up fast enough to just get all the countries in the report. And so they included countries based on the prevalence of the problem and the information they had. And so some countries were, were left out. And so we tried to take account of the factors that would determine whether they were in the report uh, to begin with. And we found that those factors themselves were not related to whether or not a country would pass a domestic law. But then we found that uh, that uh, the factors that were uh, um, uh, driving whether countries got really poor grades uh, also were not really associated with whether or not a country criminalized. So now the two most important factors for why we would think this report is driving uh, criminalization behavior were really not, uh, not validated. And based on that, uh, we then found that whether a country criminalized human trafficking was increased by, if they had been included in the report, they were more likely, regardless of which grade they had gotten, even tier one countries were more likely, on average, to criminalize human trafficking than countries that have been left out of the report. And, but also that the worse your, your grade was, the, the faster you were gonna criminalize human trafficking. And also this, this, this downgrade, that, that when you got a grade that was bumped down, that sort of was a motivating factor for the country. Um, so I said to you, I would talk a little bit about, and I should probably stop very soon to give you a chance to ask questions. I would talk a little bit about what I, I think are some of the factors that, um, uh, that 
that condition whether or not this kind of strategy works, because not all countries are equally concerned about their reputation. So what are some of the factors that play in here? And this is more based on, on case study analysis uh, of, the, of the 15 case studies that are on that website I pointed out earlier. But if, if, the, if the driving factor is that countries are concerned about your reputation, you have to take a step back and understand what drives that in the first place. And here I argue that there are two important factors. One is exposure, and the other one is what I call sensitivity. So exposure is how much are they exposed to criticism to begin with, right? Uh, in this case, the report itself is an exposure uh, that drives reputation. There could also be high-profile events like a big scandal in human trafficking that gets a lot of attention, uh, or, or other active third parties, like countries that have active NGO societies that are highlighting this. So the more exposed you are to criticism on a particular issue, the more you're going to be concerned about your reputation on that. The other thing is, there's variation in how sensitive countries are to this type of concern. And many of you probably sat there in the beginning and thought, oh, well, don't all countries just want to like eliminate human trafficking? And um, when I first made this argument to uh, uh, one of the top dogs inside the State Department who was running this office, we're sitting at a cafe, and she had just taken a, a sip of, of, of her tea, and she literally snorted out all over the table, like because it was she had such a violent reaction to the statement that this was an easy thing to do. Um, it is not an easy thing to do, and there are many countries that um, uh, where, where they've had to uh, fight very hard to overturn cultural norms about what is and is not acceptable. Uh, there are societies in which. Uh, the victims are uh, uh, vilified. There are societies, actually, in the, uh, one of the more recent State Department's report, over 58 countries are listed as having domestic complicity in this, so, you know, in, in, inside the government. Uh, so countries that have these uh, cultural differences, uh, legal normative differences in how they define the problem, um, are, are less sensitive, of course, to the difference in the international uh, uh, norms, right? If, if you take issue with them, you're not going to be as sensitive to that, to those reputational concerns. <clears throat> so if you have those factors that are feeding into reputational concerns, it's also not the case, though, that reputational concern just leads to action, right? Because there's this other factor that's going to modify whether that is the case, and that's the fact that countries have a set of priorities on their agendas, and that varies hugely whether or not they're able to pay attention to. One, do they have the capacity, but also can they fit it on their agenda? Like a country like Honduras, you know, huge drug problem, huge poverty, all sorts of other stuff going on. It's difficult, even if they are worried about the reputation of them, to really gain traction on something like this. Ironically, it's actually been um, the case that in some, sort of, uh, some, some societies that base their authority on religious premises, that they have the right to reign. Uh, because the issue is sort of based on morals and that, that challenge, you know, your religious uh, uh, uprightness, if you think it's okay just to have sex trafficking, they, they're actually sensitive to those kinds of concerns. Um, so um, I, I close just with saying a little bit about what I think this, uh, some of the implications for this is and some of the questions it raises. Um, uh, one thing, of course, is that as we've seen the field of these kinds of ratings and rankings become saturated, you know, is it possible for there to be 160 things that a country cares about? Uh, probably not. And there's certainly a lot of fluff ones out there that are just like Forbes rating countries on like Dimension X because they want to sell an article. And that's not the same thing. Um, so there is a, the possibility of saturation in, in this issue. Um, and, uh, but, uh, one of the keys that I've seen to the good ones versus the bad ones, and here I mean in terms of the world of indicators more broadly, is if they're consistent and accurate. Uh, and, and by accurate meaning they can document why they're making the decisions that they are making. Um, and they're sort of they're moving the goalposts by <coughs> changing the definitions over time is, is, is problematic. And, and the importance of pairing this with policy engagement. It would be a folly to think that this is just some sort of panacea if we just publish some grades and everything uh, gets fixed. Uh, but if you think about it more broadly in the terms of global governance, you know, it's, it's increasingly difficult to coerce states to do things. And we don't, 
you know, we don't have great results for sanctions and other things like that either. So we think, so I think we need to have a, a, a very um, uh, diverse approach to how we think about our ability to influence different countries. And so something might work in one country and not in another, and we have to think about the different tools that we can bring to bear. Uh, and especially in a context where information is becoming so so pervasive. But there are definitely uh, definitely risks, and the, the last chapter of the book talks a lot about some of the pushback the United States has gotten, uh, uh, and some of the criticisms. Uh, why couldn't this happen in a multilateral form instead of the United States in this particular case? Um, many uh, ratings and rankings are issued by IGOs or by NGOs, fewer by states. Um, I address in, in the book why, in this case, multilateral fora would be less well suited to, to this um, particular topic. So um, I, I'll stop there because I want to give you a chance to ask some, some questions, and I welcome them. So. Yes. Um, so how do you think or do you think that the allegations of politicization of the TIP has affected its legitimacy and therefore its efficacy? First of all, they're true. The allegations are definitely true. Um, and uh, so the allegations you, uh, you're referring to, I mean, some of them have really uh, surfaced in the last couple of years uh, in connection with the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations and other things like that, but actually it goes back a long time, and there has always been horse trading on this issue. Um, one of the really interesting things I learned from this project, like, you know, was that I used to just think about the State Department, then I used to think about embassies. And I never thought about regional offices, regional bureaus. But it turns out the regional bureaus are really powerful, and they're like bureaus that the State Department also has around the world, and that these bureaus have a very different set of interests from, say, your local embassy, because they see a much different and bigger perspective. So the infighting within the State Department is enormous over these ratings and rankings, and of course trading definitely at first. I think the, 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 in the early years, uh, the report was very bold. And for example, uh, <coughs> Japan got a bad grade, Israel got a really bad grade, and it was like, how the heck did that, you know, how did, they, how did this office get away with that? But they sort of got it under the radar in the early years, and then there were some years where we started to see more politicization, and now you can really see the, um, uh, the legislation that's being reauthorized all the time continually trying to hammer out more specificity in the standards. I think that the, uh, what happened a couple of years ago uh, around the, um, uh, the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Trans Partnership and other um, uh, uh, political issues that, that, that that compromised certain ratings, also happened during a time when the ambassador that was in charge of the office had resigned and there was nobody in charge. And that was a really dangerous time. And now we have a new ambassador in the office and she happens to be a uh, public policy alum of our school across the road, Susan Kovic. And I think she's done, uh, she's tried hard to rein it in. Uh, and, and, but it's a, it's, it's a, real, uh, it's a real danger. And uh, I've talked a lot with people inside the State Department and people on the Hill about uh, the need to allow independence to this office to issue these ratings because otherwise, you don't have credibility, it just goes out the window. And that's just a real shame given what they've built up with the tool. Yeah. So you did, it's a great project. I love the mixed methods and you know the fact that you have so many different takeaways, policy relevant ones, theoretical ones, et cetera. Um, I have two, a question that kind of has two observations to it. So one is, you'll, the project purports to be about uh, rankings in general, but at least from your presentation, you're heavily focused on TIP. Yeah. And I wondered how much what you find here is generalizable to other kinds of rankings that don't have, at least during the period of your mm -hmm. study, the very high level support from a very powerful state. Yeah. Um, and then related to that, when you talk about the cycle, um, given where the State Department is now, yeah. which is quite um, <laughs> yeah. you know, lacking in personnel in a number of areas, I don't know yeah. specifically whether this office has been affected, mm -hmm. but um, to what extent can the cycle go on without the kind of active push by a powerful 
government like the United States and its various officials around the world. So they're linked. On the one hand, yeah. is this a sui generis United States mm -hmm. story? Mm -hmm. And whether or not it is, yeah. can it continue if the United States pulls back? Yeah. So the first question is, I don't think it's unique to this case. So the book focuses uniquely on this case because I felt like the real need to take a deep dive from a multi-method approach because causality is so impossible to establish when you have this kind of observational situation. However, Beth Simmons, uh, who used to be at Harvard and is now at UPenn, uh, and I have been working on a larger project in which we have brought together people from 15 different issue areas who have analyzed this in different contexts. And Beth and I also wrote a paper on the ease of doing business uh, indicators, but of course the World Bank is also a very powerful actor, but it's not, it's not the United States. Um, and um, and we, have, we have people in that collection that are working on some things that, are, are, um, that don't have this kind of power behind them. For example, there's something called the A Transparency Index. And the A Transparency Index is published by something called Publish What You Fund. And Publish What You Fund, I visited their office in London. Their, their entire offices are literally no bigger than this room, and then they have some carols and maybe 10 people that work there. And they have literally turned around the transparency of, of donor reports from all the major donor agencies over the last 10 years. Uh, the senators in the United States uh, Senate has bragged about the standing of the USAID and of the Millennium Development uh, Fund in these rankings and asked how can we keep it and how can we help others do better and get up in their rankings, etc. Um, so there definitely are examples of small nonprofit type of actors being able to pull this off. Of course, power power helps, uh, but it's not a necessary um, not a necessary condition. There are other <coughs> examples um, as well. Um, and about your question uh, on how you know is this sustainable? Um, and particularly in the in the State Department and with the with funding cycle, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think the office itself has been affected by the seven cuts, uh, as, as, as at least as, as I know. Um, but um, I mean, there are definitely issues of sustainability in any kind of uh, uh, effort like this. I've I've been surprised to see that countries continue to pay attention to it um, and. Um, there are there are countries that have created offices now whose job it is essentially to try to stay on top of their country's ratings and rankings uh, in general. Um, of course, it also leads, can lead to gaming and all sorts of other behaviors. Uh, you know, countries figure out just what are the same buttons I need to push to move up in the rankings and ratings. And as I started out by saying, this should be perceived as an argument about bang for the buck, not just sort of absolute absolute power. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? I also was very surprised when I first heard about the um, reaction of civil society to yeah. the report. Because yeah. It definitely goes against um, many of the public statements made by yeah. sort of NGOs who talk about particularly the politicization, the fact yeah. that uh, governments they are trying to change the policy of getting a good ranking from the United States really derails a whole bunch of local advocacy mm -hmm. efforts. So, who were the civil society? What was the composition of the groups that you were speaking with? Yeah, sort of talking through that. Absolutely. Before. So, um, so we spent two years just putting together a database of civil society around the world that were involved with human trafficking, and and of course we can't get organizations that are not online. They have to have some kind of online presence. Uh, but we put together uh, a, a database that was uh, just around a thousand organizations, and we we. Felt like it was pretty exhaustive, and we got to a point where it's just really, really difficult to find a new one and go, Oh, it's not there. Um, and what was really surprising to me was this was launched as an online survey. And I offered, if you don't like to take an online survey, particularly on a sensitive topic like this, I'm happy, you know, to uh, to phone you. Or, and I, I, did, I did end up doing some phone calls. But what I was really surprised about, an online survey like this, and the response rate was through the roof. I mean, compared to what you normally get in online response rates of NGOs, I have friends who run those, and they're like, they're like exuberant if they get 4% or something like this. And we got like nearly 50%, which is amazing. Just absolutely amazing. And the reason is that these 
these NGOs really care. And they're so excited that somebody is interested in human trafficking. Uh, we asked them questions about how much they themselves thought they knew about domestic trafficking policies. And we asked them questions about, um, you know, do they focus on women or children and all these kinds of things. And all those demographics are laid out in a, sort of in a separate article. Um, but I guess the, 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 in terms of their potential biases, the main thing really was that uh, by far the majority of them were headquartered outside of the United States. So, uh, and even we took out the ones that had headquarters in the United States, and took out the ones that got funding from the United States, it really didn't change the nature of the, of the response that we got. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, let's all be on the test tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.